Okay, it is 11 o'clock, and so we are going to go ahead and start our webinar. Uh, welcome to everybody who is in attendance. Um, I hope we have a lot of good information for you today. Uh, my name is Wesley Young. I'm the Director of Services for International Students and Scholars here at UC Davis. And uh, we are very lucky to have a number of presenters today from Wolfsdorf Rosenthal, uh, an immigration law firm. Um, Bernie Wolfsdorf and Josune Aguirre are both attorneys uh, that will be presenting uh, this, uh, this morning. And then also Tammy Silver from our office will be on hand for the question and answer period uh, afterwards. Um, the goals of today's webinar really are just to help us understand where we are today. Uh, there have been a number of uh, regulations that have come out and, and uh, the, the regulatory landscape seems to change every day. So um, hopefully we'll give you a better idea of where we stand today uh, with the regulations. Um, we have uh, two ways that you can communicate with the panel. One is the chat function. So if there seems to be a technical difficulty, if, if we're not uh, uh, broadcasting the way we should, that's probably a good use of the chat function. But if you have questions for us, please use the question and answer box, which is a separate, which is separate from the chat function to input your questions. Uh, today's session will be recorded. So if you're not here or if you have friends and colleagues who are not here, uh, we will have that available on the SISS website uh, probably by tomorrow. So uh, I know you're not here to listen to me, so I'm going to turn this over to Bernie. You want to go ahead and get started? Well, Wes, thank you so much. It, it really is a pleasure. And um, uh, kudos to uh, UC Davis uh, Global Affairs, because I, I think um, you folks have been uh, leaders in um, holding these type of Zoom webinars and uh, scheduling them uh, coincidentally, by the way, at exactly the right time. Uh, your, your timing is perfect, uh, um, Wes and UC Davis team. So it really is a, a joy to uh, join uh, Director Wes Young and um, um, Tammy Silver, who uh, is the operational um, uh, key person in, in regard to I-20 issuance, et cetera. Um, my uh, senior associate, Jusune Aguirre uh, Gomez, uh, uh, Jasune is the smart one in the group, um, so uh, I, Thank you. I, uh, she's, she's been studying, um, well, you know, the, the FAQ that came out literally yesterday, uh, July 15, um, is, I mean, talk about new, uh, we get this information yesterday, uh, and even in our PowerPoint today, we included new clarification from the State Department, which only came down today. So um, let's, let's look at the overall picture first. And um, the good news here, um, the really good news is that um, the courts um, and the lawsuits that have been filed have, have caused the government to back off. Um, so it, it's not a 100% clear path. But many of the issues that, that you were all worried about um, are less concerning. They're not exactly gone, but they are less concerning. The government is understanding, uh, or more understanding, should we say, that because of COVID and, and inherent problems, um, they're cutting us a little bit of slack uh, in regard to in-person uh, in uh, classes. So, um, I don't know if we've got our PowerPoint up yet, uh, Adrian, if you can share that. Uh, I need to thank you. Um, just move into the slides right now. And um, so one of the things I always like to say, this is not legal opinion and we're not giving you legal advice. Um, what I will say is that even though we're lawyers and I'm a board certified specialist and Jasune is an attorney, the international office really is the key point of advice. What you're gonna do is get some guidance here today. We're gonna to answer some of your questions, hopefully give, give you some clarification. But at the end of the day, the final authority on this is the international office. So please be aware of that very important issue. Next slide, please. 
A little bit about our firm. We have offices in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Santa Monica, Oakland, and Shanghai. We've been specializing uh, in advising students for over 20 years. Um, so next slide, please. And yeah, that just says how great we are. And I'm the former president of the Immigration Lawyers. Next slide, please. Yep, more good stuff. Uh, there, by the way, there's my contact information, Bernard at Wolfstorf. We do have hundreds of people on the line right now. So uh, if you're sending emails, they need to be short. And um, a next slide, uh, please. There's Jasune, J Aguirre at Wolfstorf.com. J Aguirre at Wolfstorf.com. Short, please. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So this is the good news. The July 6th SEVP, SEVP broadcast. This is what caused the trouble, caused panic. And that has been rescinded. So between July 6th and July 14, there was great anxiety in the land, in the student land, in the lawyer land, and in the university and academic communities. There was panic with regard to the new broadcast, which would impact the ability to use online classes. The good news again is the federal district courts as this matter was litigated initially by Harvard and MIT, but also by University of California, UC Davis, right up there uh, on the front lines doing battle, suing the government, as well as, um, I believe, ultimately almost 20 states. As a result of these lawsuits, the government backed off and formally rescinded the July 6th broadcast. So that's, that's the big news. That's the reason that I'm kind of smiling today, feeling a little bit better. I want you all to sort of calm down by, what should I say, 40%, 50%? I wish I could say 100%, but 50% at least less anxiety as of today, because it seems like the government is listening understanding and creating some flexibility for universities to work through the issues. There are still a few more issues which are not resolved, but they are moving in the correct direction. So next slide, please. So um, Jasune, I'm gonna throw the slide at you. Um, so tell me Jasune, what exactly was the July 6 broadcast proposing? What was it all about? What, what, why, why are we having this webinar today? What was the panic? Can you summarize the situation, please? Yeah, of course. So the major change was that SEVP was going to require um, all universities, basically, to either be in person or to adopt a hybrid model because they said all um, universities who were completely remote would no longer be able to keep their international students under active. So this gave you know, universities and schools less than a month to have to one, you know, coordinate a hybrid model for their fall semester and issue completely new I-20s. So for the UCs, you know, in total, I believe it was over 55,000 that they would have had to issue. Um, and that was one huge feat that they would have had to gone through. To, uh, it, sorry, it go seemed through. almost impossible to me, quite frankly, uh, physically and to process thousands. What was the reaction, Where's in your office and Tammy? Uh, when this thing came down, and how did how did you folks respond to it? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I can describe that online. It, it was yeah, bad. Yeah, it was shock. Bad. There's a few more gray hairs there, uh, where I should point them out, but I know where they came from. So, um, 
Next slide, please. Sorry, I just want to give you some idea of what went on. We, there was just chaos in the land at every level when they came down with this uh, badly thought out proposal um, because previously they had been moderately generous in understanding and relaxing the policy. So just for information, the government's policy on online courses was developed like 10 years ago or more. And, and just didn't factor in the new reality, certainly didn't factor in COVID. So the, the regulations are quite limiting in regard to um, actually allowing online for F1 international students. So um, there's the situation. Sorry, I'm just going back to the slides. Uh, ICE agreed that it would rescind its July 6 policy. Um, they confirmed the rescission by issuing an FAQ on July 15, 2020, yesterday. And there's the link to the July 15 FAQ. We didn't list the whole thing because it's a couple pages long, but that is the operative document that many of you need to look at uh, because it is providing key guidance. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, my slides are somewhat popping up, or it's probably my great technology skills. So, um, Jasune, throwing this one back to you. Yeah. So, basically, the March 13 guidance on was the one that we liked. Yes. It basically was fairly generous, fairly understanding. And at the end of the day, the July 15 memo said, okay, we're going back to the March 13 framework primarily. Yes. Tell me what exactly that means. So the March 13 directive gave us three different scenarios. First, if a school temporarily closes due to COVID, the student can remain active because CVIS will you know, consider this the same thing as a short-term break. Um, if the school offers alternatives to in-person courses, so basically somewhat like the hybrid, right? Uh, the students should remain in active status and they will allow you know, the student to take more than the regulations um, allow for online courses. The very right? restrictive regulations. So. Very restrictive, right. So they're going to allow you know, an excess of the regulations. Great. Um, if the school offers alternatives and the international student is outside of the U.S., SCVP still said that CBIS should keep them in active status. So this is great for you know the universities and the students as well. If they are unable to return or feel that it is unsafe to return, they can still participate in the um, you know university courses that are offered remotely and remain active. So this is great. Next slide, please. So <laughs> in addition, now we have the um, July 15 FAQ. This has added some clarity um, and you see it is generally all positive in the sense of your record is no longer terminated. You know, obviously, the worst thing that anyone could have happened, or one of the worst things for a student, is that your CVIS record is terminated, creating all sorts of problems and, of course, impacting your ability. Um, uh, Jasune, just run through again the um, issues that have been clarified here. So, there's quite a few. Um, one of them is let's say, for example, a student is, you know, still in their home country. Or somewhere outside of the United States, and they don't have access to the technology resources that are required to take these remote courses. Um, they can discuss that with their DSO, and the DSO can still keep them uh, active in CBIS as long as the student intends to resume courses once in person classes resume, of course. So the next one looks a little bit scary. Can you clarify that? What do they mean that if the student is unable or refuses to return? They will yeah. be terminated. What, what, what exactly are they saying here? So as you noted, Bernie, things are quite fluid. Things are changing every day, every minute right now. 
Uh, so we hope to receive more guidance on this, but the way this reads currently in the FAQ that we just received yesterday is that if you know the university is to go back to completely normal pre-COVID and there's in-person courses and we go back to you know the regulations that they were previously bound to, so one course you know that's available online, and the international student refuses to return or is unable to return to the U.S. to attend these in-person courses, well, it seems like you know, the school is then bound by the original regulations, and so they must terminate the student's record. But it's not as bad as it looks on its face. I mean, this is when things get <laughs> back to normal. I wish we could say things are going to get back to normal, you know, in a month. Uh, but realistically, it's probably when they discover a vaccine, uh, you know, this could be months away. So uh, a whole lot less scary than what it looks like um, is our initial interpretation. Keep going, uh, Jasune. So guidance on permitted you know, electronic signatures for I-20s. I know um, certain students and even DSOs, I'm sure, had questions on whether you know, electronically signed I-20s need to be later signed you know, uh, a wet signature or such. But um, SEVP said that that's fine. You know, one electronic signature for an I-20 is valid for this time period. Uh, let's see. Which is really they, cool because, honestly, printing and getting documents and all that signed, not so easy to get a wet signature uh, in this environment, so. Yeah, also cool that, you know, the travel signature required, you know, that's usually valid for one year is still going to be valid for one year. The Although travel, travel may be difficult at this time, but still cool that it's still valid for a year. Um, they also clarified that there's no need to transfer um, the fee. So if you paid and you're unable to enroll this semester, as long as you are able to, you know, enroll within the next 12 months, that fee will be deferred. So you don't have to worry about trying to transfer it or trying to get that money back. So again, all good stuff coming down here. Um, you know, it's, it's not 100% positive, but um, as of yesterday, we're breathing a little bit better. Um, next slide, please. Keep going, uh, Jasune. You're far more articulate than, uh, than me, so um, more good news. Keep it flowing. Uh, so schools will be unable to keep their students' uh, CVS record active if the student wishes to drop due to dissatisfaction of online courses. Yeah. Um, I mean, that makes sense, right? Yeah, it's, it's a small one. So I'm not, I don't think that's unduly or unfair. Keep going. Yes, uh, they clarified this question. So they said, if there's a reduction of courses available due to COVID, can the full course requirement be adjusted? So they're saying no. Um, a student should choose to participate in the alternative learning options available. So try to choose a course that's available to you if there's you know, different available um, remote courses to you. They're basically and, saying if it's adjusted, it must be a, a direct result of COVID. And although logically speaking, a reduction of courses that are available is due to COVID, but they've made that distinction to say that is not a direct result of COVID. So I really like the next one. I think the next one is quite generous uh, for international students, uh, many of whom have had on campus employment. I don't know the numbers, but. Um, your comment on that one, yeah. Jasune. So for current um, international students who are participating on on-campus employment opportunities, uh, those who are concerned because their work has transitioned to remote work, they are still considered uh, to continue in engaging in a, you know, valid on-campus employment. So this is great. And this is also... Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, some, sorry, the logic or, you know, the reasoning behind this can also lend to the researchers. I know a lot of researchers are concerned whether um, their research that was previously on campus that is now done completely remotely, whether that would be considered permissible. And I think the reasoning, it's not, I should note, sorry, that it's not specifically stated in the frequently asked questions. So they don't mention researchers there. But I think the reasoning that they provide for on-campus employment opportunities should lend to the reasoning that, you know, remote research would also be permissible. So this is a big one because um, they've always been quite narrow and restrictive in terms of on-campus employment. So again, right. 
uh, you know, they didn't want to see abuse, then they want to make sure that we, we always get a lot of questions on what constitutes on campus employment, at least during this COVID crisis. Uh, remote work uh, is, yeah. is acceptable. Keep going, Jasune. More good news, please. Yes. Um, can we go to the next, next slide, please? Next slide, please. Keeps it keeps flowing. Yeah. So students currently participating in OPT, including STEM OPT, may work remotely um, if their employer has an office outside of the U.S. or if the employer can assess student engagement using electronic means. So uh, if you're working remotely... Honestly, this this is so big for so many of you, uh, you know, who, we, as I say, look, let's hope that, you know, the COVID crisis is resolved in two to three months. But what if it's not resolved in the next 10 months? Then obviously uh, this is going to impact many of you who would be seeking OPT. And um, I think this honestly is about as generous as anyone could expect. So. This is really good news. Uh, number eight, lucky eight, they call it. Huh. Uh, Jasune, please continue. Number nine. So this is also big. Students may engage in CPT during their time abroad, provided they are, one, enrolled in a program of study in which CPT is integral to the program of study, which... That's a standard anyway. Yes, of course. Two, their DSO authorized CPT in advance of the CPT start date, also required. required. And three, Either the employer has an office outside of the U.S. or the employer can assess student engagement and attainment of learning objectives electronically, which today should not be a problem. But. So the reality is that OPT, CPT, that because we had so many questions on this, by the way, um, they've, they've cut us honestly as much slack as they possibly can. So, um, you know, this is why I'm saying maybe I should kick that up from breathing 50 percent better to breathing 70% better. It's just that when, you know, I still have to see all of this in operation, uh, but this is, this, this is guidance that we certainly like. This is guidance that all of you uh, need to, quite frankly, have available. Um, uh, look at this FAQ, print it out, uh, study it because it, it's good for you. Next slide, please. And an F student accrues eligibility for practical training, whether they're inside or outside of the U.S. during COVID-19. So if the student is in active status, they're accruing that possibly one year or, you know, three year, whatever it may be. OPT under 20 hours now. This is another good one. Oh, yes. This one's great. So for the duration. 20 hour minimum. Yeah. That's huge. And so. You know, they'll be clear, you know, a lot of people have problems getting uh, jobs and there are restrictions on unemployment uh, during OPT, uh, currently 90 and 150 days with STEM. So now if your hours were reduced to 10 hours a week, uh, I mean, I don't know, don't push it folks down to one hour a week, okay, because that's not good faith. But if it's still employed at, you know, maybe 10 or 15 and excusable or explainable, uh, don't just please, you know, uh, break the rules. I mean, I, I really would still continue to advise OPT students that they should work 20 hours a week. But if there is a, a framework where they could explain why they could not work 20 hours a week, then yes, we can cut it some slack. But again, please don't take advantage because you know this is an FAQ. We still have regulations. They are easing on the regulations. So please don't interpret this um, beyond um, what you should. Um, the DSOs, you know, we talk about, as you note, the DOs, DSOs have to certify this. Uh, we're talking about um, Tammy Silver's signature on that form. You know, don't put her in a difficult position of, of um, bad faith because the international office also has to monitor these things. So, um, okay, uh, this next one doesn't really mean a lot to me. Uh, 
when normal operations resume, uh, you expect it to come back, which makes sense uh, to me. Um, Jasuna, any other comment on these? No, I mean, it, it's basically the regular regulations, right? Within 30 days of the next available session start day. Yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, look, the truth is with flights and all that, you can't get anything done in 30 days. But, you know, we're talking about when it gets back to normal and, and there will be more guidance at that point. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what's still unclear. Um, there are three things we're still um, waiting and hoping for, um, which we'll keep pushing on. Hopefully there'll be more news. Uh, can you apply for OPT and CPT while outside the United States? I, I've, I believe you can, and I believe you should if you are. Uh, but I can't tell you at 100% at this point that it is permissible. Um, I was wondering if uh, Wes or Tammy, um, I could ask you to comment on that because clearly these applications need your authorization. Um, have you had a chance to go through this and uh, what are your views on this? Uh, I can go ahead and I can, I'll start. Um... I think that the other comment on the previous slide regarding CPT yep. uh, alludes to that if if students are um, outside of the U.S. Um, and they uh, have gotten uh, authorization from our office prior to beginning the work, and the office that they're working for ha is either uh, has an office abroad or they can be um, evaluated online, um, I think CPT would be fine um, outside the US. I do still think that um, what's not mentioned, uh, I think it's understood that um, students may uh, are eligible also once they have been in F1 status for one academic year. So, so I think that this is referring to students who are outside of the United States in active status already. Um, for OPT, we don't know because on the I-765 form, it does say that this has to be uh, submitted from inside the United States. But we're in a very strange time right now. And if the, the student has to weigh the risk and the benefit, and the risk is that they spend the money and they get denied, uh, and the benefit is that they spend money and they get approved. So if the student is willing to take the risk, um, really all that can happen is that they're denied. And if they understand that, then um, I would encourage them to try. I have one thing to add. The FAQ yesterday does state, since USCIS adjudicates you know, these EADs for OPT, to reach out to USCIS um, to see if they have any further guidance, which at this time they don't, but maybe you know, that is some type of guidance that we will receive soon. Well, we always discourage people from um, even traveling with OPT ending um, historically, um, but uh, you know, this is pushing it one layer further the truth, of course, again, because this is new, we don't know. Uh, but, um, and, and I think Tammy put it very clearly, uh, the biggest risk is you're going to lose your filing fee. Um, it's not that uh, cheap, but um, I, I, at this point, we are saying, um, look, um, go for it. Um, explain it. Uh, there are certain uh, applications that require you to be physically present. Uh, at the time you file um, the other element which they brought in, and I'm going to talk about it briefly, I'm not sure that it applies right here, is that they have brought in the concept of discretion right now, giving officers more discretion. So presumably if they have more discretion, they could exercise that discretion favorably. Um, what I personally fear is that in the general uh, framework of this administration, maybe their discretionary powers won't be as positive. We don't know yet. Um, again, uh, one of the things that I wanted to clarify for all of you um, is SEVP is under ICE. 
So the Department of Homeland Security has different branches. Um, the Department of Homeland Security has uh, SEVP or ICE, which regulates students uh, in regard to uh, when they're in the US and the CFIS database, et cetera. But it's USCIS, a separate agency that grants the OPT. So um, that's a separate application. And then just to clarify, there's a um, third agency, uh, which is not under DHS, that's the Department of State abroad, the consuls that issue the visa. And then we've got a fourth one that's very relevant, which is CBP, Customs and Border Protection. So ICE, USCIS, and CBP all come under DHS, and then the State Department or DOS is where you get your visa. And why am I talking about all these different agencies? Because they don't always communicate well with each other. So we have the rules, and then we have the interpretation, and we have four different agencies. So one of the things that I want you to be aware of, where I said to, to people, you know, please print out, okay, that's old fashioned. Please keep a copy of this July 15th guidance, because this comes from ICE, and when you're entering the United States, you're going to bump into CBP. And, you know, if you said to them, well, I said, they could technically say to you, well, I can say whatever it wants. I decide whether you come in. So just remember when you enter the US, make sure you have all your ducks in a row. Make sure you have all your documents ready. Make sure that you can articulate the reason why you should be admitted. Um, I've always said they want to see serious students. And you know, UC Davis is a well-respected institution. I would imagine that generally speaking, um, they will be supportive and not nitpicky, but um, that's where we are. So two other questions, we're still waiting for guidance. Um, again, during OPT, during your initial 12 month of OPT, you are only allowed 90 days of unemployment. Otherwise, you are violating your status. We now know that you can drop below 20 hours a week, which is nice. Please don't drop too much below there because it's going to look bad faith. Um, but what we think we should get is some discretion on people who have more than 90 days of unauthorized employment. Technically, if you have more than 90 days of employment, you violated status, and you know that's a problem. The 150, which is an additional 60 days, is for STEM OPT. That's for the STEM extension, for the 24-month extension. Actually, 150 days in a period of three years is not a lot of unemployment, or maybe it is. I'm not sure. But whatever it is, you need to keep a calendar you need to be counting those days. And this is not something new. We're hoping that they will give us some discretion on this. Um, more recently, at least this year, they've actually been enforcing this thing. We haven't really seen it being enforced uh, that much, but now we are seeing it more. Um, the other issue, of course, is grace periods, 30-day uh, grace period, 60-day grace periods. Uh, we'd like to see them uh, you know, the problem of people who, who have completed, for example, their OPT and they want to go back home, uh, but uh, they can't get a flight. Uh, there's no flights back to China. How do you fly? And the flights that do go out are extremely expensive. So hopefully they won't be punishing us. But what I am cautioning students with, if you're using this story, well, there was no flight available, please take a screenshot of um of your attempt uh orbits or whichever one you use uh take a screenshot to show there were no flights available and and save that because you may uh, in the future when things get back to normal have to explain that uh let's move on to the next slide please Okay, so I kind of spoke a little bit about this. So the government came out with some new email every day. It's, it's kind of, oh gosh, 
we get new uh, guidance every day and they basically said that they are going to apply a new discretionary standard. There are some applications which have always been discretionary. Now there are two things about discretionary. Discretionary can be good in the sense of approving something that arguably shouldn't. For example, when you apply for an EAD and you're abroad, or discretion could be bad and they're going to say, well, we don't think this is justified. Sorry, you're denied. And, you know, that's not appealable. That's not challengeable. So I'm a little bit nervous just because I'm distrusting. I do not trust them. Uh, you can fight them. They back off and then it gets better. But I feel that generally the administration is has been somewhat tough. Um, I won't get into the politics of this because um, I'm probably not allowed to do that kind of stuff. I don't want to deal with it. I just want to try and give you the facts so that you can navigate politics, leave that to the politicians for today. Um, you know, there may be changes. Clearly, these things are, to some degree, impacted by political events. So one of the second points, you know, this is our second webinar. We had another one. Unfortunately, the previous webinar that we did, uh, which I assume is available through the office because it was recorded, you kind of need to look at that one as well. You actually have to listen to both of these webinars. And the reason why is the previous one related to other forms of restrictions. We're going to touch on some of the other restrictions, but there are so many proclamations in force right now that even I, who deal with this every day, is having some confusion. Which ones apply? Is it, you know, there's 15 different rules that impact uh, foreign nationals. Um, I don't know why they say use the word foreign nationals again, international students, um, but it's, it's quite, um, quite daunting, quite frankly, just catching all these various proclamations. So, um, and then there's this other issue which kind of makes some of this hypothetical because consular offices, the place where you get the visa. So, you know, you need to get a visa to travel. I mean, having an I-20, great. If you're Canadian, that's a different story because Canadians are visa exempt. But if you're from any other country and you do not have a valid F1 visa, then the issue is how do you get a new visa Consulates are supposed to start open in, in July, July 15, but depending on where you are, let's just say hypothetically you're in Melbourne, Australia, they're having some sort of flare up right now of COVID. And, um, you know, I doubt the consulate's going to be open in Melbourne. Maybe you can travel to Sydney, but there are rules in Australia prohibiting people from traveling from one state to the other. So even if you're in Australia, you cannot go, uh, by the way, I don't know, this is a fact, I'm just giving sort of an example, that you may not be able to travel from Melbourne to Sydney to go to the consulate there to apply for a visa. So you have to factor in all of these other circumstances as well, um, which is, okay, well, you know, now that ICE is ready to approve my study program and issue an I-20, I now have the practical issue of how do I get that visa if the consulate's closed? So kind of a challenging issues as well. F1 visa uh, for students who will participate in only online. Um, just, you know, you want to comment on that. I don't think it's relevant for us because no. UC Davis is not going to be there. UC Davis will be the hybrid. So maybe we can skip that issue and move to yeah. the next slide. I kind of already uh, uh, went through this one. Um, this is something unrelated. This is now a USCIS policy alert saying that it's consolidated existing guidance to explain certain EAD applications. You know, I don't know what we're going to do in dealing with this. I, I, I would consider adding a paragraph to my EAD application, which says, I believe that this application is merit worthy because uh, 
it, you know, it's going to help me uh, round off my education or because something, you know, optional practical training yeah. is not a blank ticket to work in the US. It's optional practical training. It has to be practical training. It's not just some general work permit. So I would look, this is new. I don't know. It's too new to comment, but just as a lawyer, I would put in a thing, a paragraph, uh, if, I if I submitted a cover letter which said, um, you know, uh, dear uh, examiner, um, please exercise favorable discretion uh, because uh, this work experience uh, will benefit me. Of course, the, the DSO has already certified that uh, it meets the requirements, but perhaps just add one or two positive uh, sentences in there. Uh, I would be most appreciative uh, if, if you could please approve this application. Next slide, please. Sorry, Bernie, there's one thing I'd, I'd add. They did give us, you know, a few of the factors that they'd like to see weighed in. So they're looking at possibly home ties or ties to the US. They're looking at whether they have, you know, a criminal history um, and then some, you know, good factors such as paying taxes. Well, yeah, so, shouldn't, shouldn't be paying taxes. Th those, those general guidelines, however, I don't exactly feel connect directly to the EAD. There are guidelines in there. Um, this ties to your home country. Um, you know, I'm not sure where they're going with this one. Remember, every F1 has to have a home abroad. Uh, the, generally speaking, that is not always... Well, it, quite frankly, it's applied differently uh, depending on where you come from. Um, but all students have to have an intent to return home. So uh, if true, because I, I can't and I won't tell people to say things that are not true, but um, the sentence that I would consider helpful, assuming it was true, based on what Jasune just said is, I would greatly appreciate if you could please approve my um, employment authorization document to engage in practical training. Um, I've got a fantastic job offer from um, a, a company back home, and this experience would be very valuable uh, for that job, which starts a year from now. So again, you can't say that if it's not true, but if it were true, that's what they're talking about, showing that um, OPT is not a way to find yourself a path to living in America. OPT is to round off your education so that when we send you back home, uh, you have uh, uh, got some actual valuable work experience. Um, yeah, look. Um, okay. Let's move on now to, this is a repeat of some of the other stuff. And the reason why we're talking about the, these right now, and this is not even this full spectrum, uh, is something I mentioned earlier, which is that, yeah, you know, we've got these student proclamations, July 6th, we've got an FA, which was a broadcast, not a proclamation. Um, we have July 14th, we have FAQs, but you have to kind of look at all of these different things. I spoke about the issue of travel and consulates. So um, now we're going to talk about bans. So there's still a COVID ban for people coming from China, from Iran, from the Schengen countries. Although, uh, Jasuna, I'm going to ask you to comment on that because there's some loosening up there. Uh, yeah. The Schengen countries, as all of you know, primarily the European countries. Uh, the UK, so, you know, big country, Ireland and Brazil. So there are bans in regard to people coming from these COVID countries, which need to be taken into effect. There are economic bans. Um, this primarily relates to people applying for uh, green cards overseas. It does not relate to people in the US applying for green cards. So it actually 
only applies to a relatively small percentage of immigrant visa categories. Um, scratch that. A small percentage of the people because most of the people in those categories are applying in the US. Um, and then of course, the new travel ban, which uh, 10052, I don't know how else to describe it other than 10052, which was uh, the subject of our prior webinar relates to travel ban. It basically extended the immigrant ban, which came from April, Sorry, there's so many of these things. And um, it added the non-immigrant categories, work categories, most of the work categories, except for, um, that was including H's, by the way. Um, but that's for people who were outside the country at that time. So uh, being able to get a new H1 is, is a problem uh, if you were outside the country as of um, 10 0 Zero fifty-two being enacted, which was just soon. Help me. It's June twenty-three, June twenty-second, June twenty-second. But so you had to be present in the U.S. Oh, on present on June twenty-fourth. So it was issued June twenty-second, and they said it was effective June twenty-fourth. Thank you. That's why uh, we have to have smart people. I have to have smart people around me to help me. With the dates effective June 24th. So people who are in the US at that time were not impacted. And the big news, which I'm going to go into later, which is also positive new guidance from the State Department, is that spouses of these people, derivatives, spouses and children of these people who were outside the United States on that date are going to be okay. So more good news in regard to 10052, but that's not really the topic for today, which is focused on F1 student visas, but there might be some H1s who were in the US and maybe their spouses or kids were uh, back home over the summer. And the good news is as of today, when the consulates open, they will be able to um, get visas for the derivatives. And then, of course, we have the national security. Uh, this was the uh, one relating to Chinese students uh, attending certain universities. We haven't seen the full impact of that yet. We don't believe it's going to be as scary as it sounded, but it's too early to tell. Uh, there's always new national security ones. There are talk. There is talk about coming out with a new national security restriction on Chinese diplomats. Um, this is not good news, um, but that should not impact the people on this call, which is F1 students, just more unpleasantry. Um, and there's also another new one. Uh, I'm just mentioning it's not even related, but China, uh, Hong Kong always had its own separate quota. Uh, so people coming from Hong Kong uh, or people born in China who was married to somebody from Hong Kong were not subject to these terrible waiting lines, and now they are. So uh, this is awful. Nigeria got banned, Burundi got banned, and now I'm also mentioning I'm, the thing I'm not talking about is the various what they call Muslim bans, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And um, there's another, I forget even the number, uh, it's six or seven countries uh, who are, uh, Jashine, did you want it to jump in there? No, 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 sorry, I was agreeing. <laughs> okay, there's another six or seven countries, but that, uh, that's, those bans have been in place for close to three years right now. And um, by the way, they were supposed to be temporary bans, um, but we're three years later, and the temporary has not ended, so it's not that temporary. Um, just popping up with my slides. Uh, the situation for Canada and Mexico is kind of different. Uh, situation with regard to crossing the border, um, whether you um, cross a land border from Canada or Mexico, 
um, and I'm talking now about Canadian and Mexican nationals. Um, Jasune, would you clarify for us in regard to people traveling from Canada, and I'm talking about Canadians coming down? Yeah. And, and uh, the difference between crossing at a land border in regard to non-essential travel, um, fill us in on, on those issues because we probably have a few Canadians and Mexican nationals, but the students are not having any problem, right? This relates to other categories. Yeah, so if a Canadian or Mexican national or any, you know, foreign nationals coming in from Canada or Mexico through a land border, they have to discuss with CP their essential travel, right? So they have to meet that standard as to why. So if they're, you know, an international student um, coming to enter to proceed with your school program, even if you're going to attend school remotely, should pass essential travel. However, you don't have to go through that high scrutiny or that scrutiny, I should say, uh, if you were to travel through air. So if you were to come to an airport, um, then you don't have to discuss all this essential travel. What, what, what a crazy policy. The bottom line is fly, don't drive. Uh, it's yeah. better to fly, not to drive. And Mexico seems to be fairly generous in regard to both, correct? Yeah, they're, they're not giving, you know, so many students or so many foreign nationals the hard time that we're hearing on the board of Canada. That's sort of anecdotal, by the way, is whatever. But, okay, so <laughs> those are small sub-situations. I don't want to get lost in the weeds on that. But just, yeah. you know, what I'm trying to explain here is this stuff is complicated, folks. I, I do apologize. The student rules, we just sort of learning to understand them and as you can see i'm leaning heavily on jasune because she's been up all night uh studying and reviewing and trying to understand these new rules even for us it's complicated but then when you do understand them please remember that you have to deal with the COVID rules and the economic bans and the national security bans and um jasune i wonder if you can comment on one other which is travel from your home country. There are also restrictions um, for uh, one that I picked up recently um, because my, uh, my partner mentioned it, is people leaving India have to have a visa stamp valid for at least 30 days. Uh, so if your F1 visa is, is only got 20 days left on it, that can be an issue. So in addition, to all the US rules, which is what I'm dealing with today, please also understand the rules from your home country. Because exactly. America is, um, you know, gosh, we have over 3 million people uh, with like what, 20% of the world's cases or something. Um, so there are restrictions from your home country uh, in regard to travel. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. Ah, this was the good news. Uh, this is something else. This is July 10. Now, I don't know what the whole history of this is, quite frankly, but um, Americans, I did just mention, uh, we have over 3 million COVID cases and, and um, parts of Europe are getting much better um Jasune help me with this I believe there so Europe on July the 10th I think it was July the 10th uh the EU published restrictions on uh, scratch that published exemptions for certain countries and um, the bottom line is American tourists are banned most American tourists are banned from from visiting Europe um so that you know, was kind of not so nice uh, and a little bit concerning. And I think a lot of Americans would be upset to discover we're getting a little bit of, pardon me, sting, our own sting. Uh, you know, now we can't go. Americans have always been able to travel almost anywhere uh, without restriction, not understanding any of this kind of visa stuff that foreign nationals have to deal with. 
Um, so now some good news. Again, the U.S. government is basically backing off a little bit. And uh, in that backing off process, they have specifically said that F1 students qualify for the National Interest Waiver. This, again, started literally yesterday. And they included in there the categories that impact most of you, which is the Fs and the Js. So um, this, I think, is pretty, pretty good news. Um, Jasune, comment on this NIE and how you think it benefits um, our audience today. Yeah, no, this is you know very exciting. So it's effective as of yesterday. Uh, this is dealing with those who have been to Europe, right? All those European countries, uh, or most of them, to in the last 14 days, and they're trying to enter the U.S. And so, if they're a student or a J1 professor, research scholar, short-term scholar, or specialist, then they can request a national interest exemption, saying that they're either entering to pursue the full course of study or to, you know, pursue the J1, uh, you know, category. So then that means that they either Department of State, if they're requesting a visa or CBP, if you need to request a, a travel exemption due to the travel ban, will then likely grant you that exemption because they have laid out that this is in the national interest. They want to be in students and academics. So this is, so you know, Jacinda, you've, you, you've already made, you've been doing national interest exception uh, applications for some time uh, for healthcare workers, et cetera. And can you describe for, uh, the, the information that the consulate wants, they want you to show uh, what, what your plan is for uh, self-isolation and what your program is. Just help our audience understand what is a, NI, what is a need? I just made that up, N-I-E, I guess it's a need. What is a need and what do they look like? Because I know you've done a few of them already. Yeah, so if you're going through the consulate or embassy, uh, before they even bring you in for the interview, they're going to ask you those questions. Have you exhibited any COVID-19 symptoms? Have you been tested for COVID-19? Um, what are your plans to self-quarantine and how has that been communicated either with the school or your employer? Right, so we want to make sure that- The sound is, went a little bit bad there. If you could ah. just repeat the, um, your, you have to come with a, a plan for quarantine, et cetera, et cetera. They're focusing on COVID issues here. Yes. So they're definitely, you know, honing in on the COVID issues. They want to make sure that, you know, if you have exhibited any symptoms that you have been tested, you can share that test with them um, and that you have a clear plan to self quarantine in the U.S. and that that is communicated to either your DSO or your employer. Right. Um, and your after great, that, your great internet connection is gobbling some of what you you say. Oh no. Um, no, it's no big deal. Um, so, um, do they have different forms for every consulate? Was there so one? Yes, yeah, different for consulate to consulate. I've had different experiences in Belfast than in London. Right. Uh, so you kind of just need to wait for their guidance and wait for the to make that request via email at the time, and you respond that way. Uh, if you have a visa, though, that's different. You can go to the, um, you can email a CBP and request that they issue an exemption. So that's so new as well. the people at the border. Um, yes. But that's because if you already have a valid Sorry, if you already have a valid visa, you don't have to go through the consulate, but you'll want to have something because if you try to board a plane and they see that you've been in one of the COVID-19, you know, countries in the last 14 days, you may be able to board without some type of I'm, confirmation. I'm going to butt in because if I can't hear clearly, probably the audience yeah. can't. Um, but the point that Jasune was emphasizing is something that I've mentioned uh, which is, please be aware that when you travel into the United States, there are 
we're talking about exemptions now. We're talking about people who are subject to COVID exemptions. We're talking about getting an exception for students and certain J's under the NIE exception. And what Jasune is telling us is that each consulate has its own form and its own procedure. And if you're not going to the consulate to get a new visa, because the consulate will notify CBP, which is customs, the border guys, the border people. And, uh, but if you already have a valid visa, then you have to reach out to CBP separately because they may not know that you have or are included in the knee. So uh, a little bit more complicated there. Let's move into the next slide, please. So this is connected to the previous point. Um, as of July 15, consular posts are opening worldwide. Uh, I believe that instructions have been given to them to open up, uh, but they have discretion and this varies. I gave the example of Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, the truth is I don't know if Melbourne's closed, but um, there was some chatter on one of the websites which uh, led me to use that. But at the end of the day, things are getting better. Things are getting better, policies are different, but we do have phased reopening depending on resources. So um, resources are obviously a big issue when you overseas in a different country and um, clearly um, COVID's a problem everywhere, pretty much everywhere, other than what Auckland, New Zealand, I guess they fully operational. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, didn't really want to go there with this one. Um, so there, there, this is complete gossip, all right? Complete gossip. Um, the only reason I put this in is that, you know, when the government gets knocked down, when this government gets knocked down, they tend to come back with something new. There is some thought that maybe this could impact new F1 students. I am not here to create panic. Um, this was honestly just a one-liner in the Wall Street Journal Will the government come back with something? I don't think so. Uh, we haven't seen it. We've seen them being nice, but at least for new students uh, who are entering, um, you know, please just keep a watch on the news uh, if if there's any changes. So as as I just said, the recent inclusion of F1 students for the NIE shows that they're trying to be nice. So that would lead me to believe that they won't come back for new students. And I thought I would put in this quote in case you haven't seen it from your very own uh, Vice Chancellor, Provost and Vice Provost. Um, all I can say is kudos, hats off to the leadership for their bold statements. This was cruel, this was thoughtless and um, the, if you haven't read the full statement, it's very, very strong. Uh, it's the, one of the reasons I believe that we are doing this today to educate you. We are following the leadership of uh, UC Davis in fighting back for what's right and correct. We all know that America benefits from international students and that, of course, international students benefit from the opportunities to study in the US. So this is, this is all good news. Let's jump over to the next slide, which is a few real life examples. Um, Jasuna, I'm throwing these at you. Sure. Um, because you helped me draft them. <laughs> um, can you run through them with us? And um, if I could just ask you and Tammy and Wes to comment if in fact, uh, because we should not be giving what I'm going to call uh, advice on internal matters. But um, so this situation, initial student, starting student is currently outside the U.S., enrolled with another school. Student wants to transfer to UC Davis for fall, although um, all classes will be remote. I don't think that's kind of completely accurate because yeah. 
I don't think all classes are going to be remote. We're going to be in a hybrid model, but um, let's let's answer this hypothetical anyway. Just you know, you there? Yeah. So the temporary guidance does not permit students in initial status and see us to begin a new program remotely, but they have acknowledged that this may be updated. They, I think, they do understand that this is an issue and that. You know, a lot of schools need guidance and permission, uh, permission how to. So I, I, just, I just wanted to deal with the narrow situation of um, there are still limitations on uh, transfers uh, into a new program. Let's go to the next one. Um, yeah. Example number two. Well, the the one positive thing was if the students in the U.S., then yes they can transfer. Sorry, can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah, this one. Can the student transfer to UC Davis fall 2020 if they were inside the United States? And the answer is yes, that should yeah. not be a problem. So, so that's one positive that's quite clear in the FAQs that were just we, issued. We yesterday. just wanted to clarify because obviously, you know, transfer ins are a big deal. And um, so we wanted to cover that one. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Okay, so we've got a student who is in Spain with a valid visa enrolled for fall. Can the student come to the US to pursue their coursework remotely? So, maybe that if you know this is an initial student, then we have to consider that. Sivas is saying that initial students, if they're going to come to um, study remotely, should stay in their home country. If this is an active student, then I don't see an issue. Uh, but we do have to deal with the travel ban, being that if they're in Spain, they're affected by the COVID-19 travel ban. Okay? However, we have that national interest exemption. And so I think this has some bit of conflicting you know, guidance. We're getting guidance from the Department of State saying that students, and it doesn't limit it to students who've been enrolled, it could be the initial students as well, um, fit in this national interest exemption. But, you know, as EVP states, initial students should stay home. So why, why we put this in uh, is um, getting, again, I mentioned to you that there's different agencies, there's SEVP, which has backed off and been a little bit nicer, but there's also the Department of State, also the CBP. These folks don't always talk to each other properly. They don't always make clear rules. Um, but the trend, I'm going to say, because the NIE literally was issued yes, yesterday, July 15, um, we are seeing an evolution that is moving towards the right place. We are seeing them moving towards being more helpful in the consulates with SEVP, meaning ICE, that gives guidance for issuance of I-20s and controls them. So we are seeing positive developments, but I wish I could tell you that it's all black and white and everything is really clear and everything is good. But that's why when I started, I said, yeah, 50% of the situations are good, 60, 70. You're not going to get 100% yet because the various different agencies are still working out where they're going. But I think what has happened, which is critical, is that the administration, when they came up with this July 6 broadcast, got hit by... Um, literally an onslaught of backlash from various states, from numerous universities, numerous lawsuits, and they realized that they'd overstepped the mark. They're trying to backtrack. Um, remember again, all of this comes from an, an old guideline, many, many years old, disfavoring online students. The whole rationale of this was that if you're coming to the United States, um, and you're going to study online, well, why are you coming to the United States? It, it, it was always from the point of view, we want you to be involved in the campus, we want you to go to classes, we want you to participate, but obviously with COVID, that is 
no longer as easy as one would think. And they're applying this guideline, which emerged years ago, to the current situation, which was plain wrong. Uh, and, and now it's being improved. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, okay, this was the good news from today. Uh, sorry, I have to learn this stuff. It is so new. You know, I wake up in the morning and uh, there's new proclamations, new guidance. This is new guidance that came from the State Department. I've already mentioned it. So the last webinar we did was on uh, 10052, which extended 10014. So 10052 was dealing with non immigrants, mainly the work visa categories, H. L, etc. And um, 10.0014 was a ban on certain immigrant categories, but the ban only applied if you were applying abroad. Since the consulates abroad were closed, it kind of didn't really mean that much. Um, but um, now we got clarification from the State Department. There was one area that we were really worried about. And that is spouses who were abroad on H, J, and L, including the prohibited J categories. And the State Department has now backed off again and said, issued a new instruction, which says that derivatives. This was like one of the cruelest things, where because of these technical rules, one spouse was in the US and the other uh, partner or child was back home because it was summertime. And then they said, well, tough luck, you are out of the US. We're not going to let you back in, uh, derivative person, which was family separation, which is cruel and inhumane. And uh, they've backed off that one. So there's a little bit of, you know, what we see as a trend towards being more understanding. We're seeing a trend towards recognizing that um, students uh, may have to take some online courses. The universities are doing the best they can in trying to uh, accommodate the government rules, um, but also recognizing that the safety of students uh, is, 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 is a paramount issue. So. Um, Again, that's the general trend. Let's move over. I think this is our last slide for today. We have been going for nearly two hours, which is a long time. Um, I wanted to turn back to you, Wes and Tammy, if you had additional questions and a special thank you to Jasune. I don't know how many of the questions we've managed to answer. I will point out that, by the way, we've sort of got hundreds of questions, but most of the questions that were asked, you know, July 6, 7, 8, when the new guidance came, quite frankly, is, are not relevant questions anymore because they've been answered. That July 6 guidance is gone. And I'm hopeful that the issues that we've covered today have given some clarity. I recognize not. 100% clarity to all the situations. But where's um, yeah. Tammy, uh, back to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Jacinta. And um, I do wanna say again, thank you very much for being here, for providing this expert uh, information to everybody here. And I know you mentioned that before, but I'll say it again, just to underscore that, you know, you and your firm have been a friend to the University in California for a couple of decades. And so we do really appreciate uh, your help. Um, and as you mentioned, a lot of the questions either are not relevant anymore, but th there were a lot of questions that came into the question box um, during the presentation. And I think some of the very specific questions, and actually there were a lot of very specific questions and situations we won't be able to address, but there's two that I, I do want to throw out at both of you um, that I think still need some clarification. You know, in the earlier webinar that you did for us, one of the bits of advice that was very clear was that if you're in the United States, don't travel. 
Um, given that we still have a month or so of summer, and again, UC Davis doesn't start until the end of September, um, is that still your advice about traveling for students that are here? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for raising that because I repeated that about five times last time. You know, the safest so solution is always stay home. The safest solution is can you get a visa in London? What if, you know, it's not open? Uh, what if, you know, they don't have resources? What if the UK comes with new restrictions on, on, on people coming out of America? So, you know, the safest route is always to stay at home um, and, and to stay local because, as I say, um, we've got ICE trying to be a little bit nicer. We've got the State Department that is operating on a very skimpy framework. They don't have great resources overseas. Um, you know, if you have an outbreak of COVID within the consulate staff, you know, that could impact a particular post and then you can't get visas there. So one of the things that people are frustrated with is people are making appointments and then the consulate cancels and then they make a second appointment. And, the, and some of the people are reporting, I don't, don't know just, you know, what your record is, but three, four, five cancellations already. So the State Department doesn't have resources. So there are so many different things. And I really, in order to not, put yourself at risk of interrupting your studies, um, please try and stay in the US as much as possible um, because that's the safest route. Okay, great. And then one other, I think, general line of questions that's come up, it seems that there's still some uncertainty about what it means to go back to the March guidelines we have a number of people asking, especially since UC Davis has uh, announced that it will be a hybrid school, right? So we, we are offering most classes online, but some classes in person. Uh, one, is it okay if they are here and only enrolled uh, in online classes? And I think the answer was yes. Is, is that right? I believe we did. Uh, Jisune, is that my understanding is that for now, if somebody is only enrolled in online, that is actually the bottom line question of this entire situation. And I'm not ready to like give a black and white yes, because in the last seminar, I was saying, you know, oh, you know, taking one dance class may not work. Um, mm -hmm. Jasune, are we ready to give this advice? Do we feel confident enough at this point? That, I mean, oh, and, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, UC Davis is going to have a good mix. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that you're going to have a good mix mm -hmm. and have that choice. But despite UC Davis offering this, somebody chooses to go 100% online. Are we comfortable enough to say that that's probably going to be okay? I mean, I not 100%, right? Because it's not black and white. The most recent FAQs don't lay that out and specify that, right? Uh, and they don't mention hybrid anywhere. But mm -hmm. uh, it does not say that if a school has some in-person courses, that they're bound to the original regulation. So when it says we're going back to the March, the way we read March um, directive is to say that if a school is hyper, that the student can be enrolled in 100% um, online courses as long as they count towards a full course of study, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's at this point, I think what we're basically saying is, please choose the hybrid model if that is possible. Mm -hmm. And if it's not possible, you're probably gonna be all right we're just not ready to give you a get out of jail free card. Sorry, I don't know. Shouldn't use yeah. monopoly analogy, but we, we're just not 100% sure. So we're still trying to push you into some in-person 
because we know that's what the government wants at the end of the day. They want to try and get things back to normal, but they have backed off. So, um, and remember, the March 15 guideline is an exception to the rule. The March 15 guideline is the rule that allows you to be more lenient uh, as a school. So we're going back to leniency. In the context of COVID, you could say, well, you're not being lenient. I mean, you're just being basically safe. Um, so if we have, let's suppose there's a student, and I'm just thinking about this, who's a particularly high risk category. Are we going to force that student to go on campus and expose themselves to a greater risk than others? I think not. I think that that student uh, has a good reason to want to go fully online and that I would love to be arguing that case uh, if somebody gave them a hard time. But again, you know, we just understand the framework. A, the rule is restrictive. B, the rule was loosened up on March 16. C, on July 6. Or thirdly, they decided to go back and be mean to us again. On July 14, they backed off being mean to us a lot. So it, it's kind of like a complicated thing. You know, it's like pressures on, pr pressures off, pressures on, pressures off. What do we currently have today where, you know, every day of the week there's new guidance, but it's moving in the direction. I ask people to please be reasonable. They always have this thing in the law called the reasonable man or reasonable woman. Um, you know, what is normal? Don't try and push the envelope. Don't try and be too creative. You know, it's like, so we have the same issue. We're driving on the freeway and the speed limit is 50. What should we be driving at? Is it safe to drive at 55? Uh, most people think it is, all right? But probably, could you be ticketed at 55? Yes, you can, if you've got a really mean officer. Or if you were rude to that officer, or if there was something else. So I'm basically saying to people, please don't drive over the speed limit, even if it's just a few miles over. Please just try and follow the rules, try and be a little bit more conservative because it's safer right now uh, to do it that way. Um, I, I know, you know, it, it, everybody's world has been turned upside down by COVID. And I know that being an international student away from your family is hard. So um, all of this has been very frustrating and very confusing. That's why we're reaching out with you, trying to answer your questions, trying to assure you. And the government is starting to listen to us, uh, or meaning the universities are starting to listen to our complaints and is. Um, is backing off a little bit. So I think we can probably sleep a little bit better. You should be sleeping a little better after this webinar, knowing that, um, that you know, the government is, is getting some of the points that we've made, that have been made. Okay, great. And then there's one other group of questions that, that seem to be pretty prevalent. Um, and this may be a little bit easier, but a number of students are asking, do I still need a new I-20? Um, you know, the July 6 guidelines talked about um, students being required to have a new I-20 with certain comments in the comment section. And uh, so, again, there's many reasons to get a new I-20, you know, travel signatures or otherwise. But as a result of the guidance, I, it sounds like we no longer have to issue, or our offices are no longer having to issue new I-20s with the comments. Is that right? That, that's my understanding. The scariest part from uh, a logistic point of view is, I, I think you have 6,000, is how right. do you issue 6,000 I-20s in 30 days? Because honestly, I think if all your staff were working 24 hours a day, you couldn't do it physically, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't do this, but I 
I'm just thinking it's enormous in, in terms of reviewing each case and mm -hmm. analyzing it. I mean, it would just not be physically possible. So uh, well, it is my, my understanding, um, and I'm going to welcome, you know, Tammy or you, is mm -hmm. that we do not need to get a new I-20 at this point. Um, and that that has uh, backed off. Um, we'll get more clarification uh, as we go down the road, but uh, as of this time, that seems to be uh, set aside. Jasune, do you have a comment on that? No, I agree. Um, Bernie and uh, Jasune, um, we have a very efficient office <laughs> and we have very efficient technology and a dedicated staff. And we have already reissued many, many, many I-20s with the remark. Right. So my, yeah, man, I mean, they, I, I would say at least half of them. I mean, they're, wow. they, we've done, we haven't signed them, but we've issued them. So what do we do with that now? Do we have to remove the remark? You know, um, I'm not ready to give an answer right now on that, honestly. The way I answer this is I, I talk to other schools. You know, there's certain comfort in, um, in being part of the herd. Uh, we don't want to be the only ones, uh, is, is the point. Um, the feedback that I got from other schools was that, you know, they couldn't do this and they weren't going to do it. Um, it, it's hats off to you that you've been able to. Um, I'm going to have to circle back to you on that one, Tammy. I know it's a big one. Um, I'm getting the impression that it's not necessary. You've got to realize that in many of these cases, there is no answer because, of course, the government hasn't thought about it. What I like so much about the provost's comment was the opening words were thoughtless. This, when they came out with this, they didn't think it through. So, I mean, getting a new I-20, uh, is a new freshly endorsed I-20 a good thing to have as opposed to an old one? Always good, always good. If I'm sitting with CBP and, and I say, is it better to have a new fresh one recently issued and they can see that the current date is, you know, after July 6th. Um, but at this point, I'm not ready to say you have to do it. I, I, I think that, I think that it's nice that you have come this far, but um, I'm not ready to say that it's required, but I'm going to have to circle back on that one, Tammy. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and my question really, I don't, I, I, now, now I don't think it's required, but my question really is, do we have to, or would it be in the student's best interest for us to remove the remark or does it not matter? You know that. And so I think it, it, maybe we could follow up uh, with you on that as well. Uh, there's one more, there's one more line of questioning that I saw that I'd like to comment on. We've been getting a lot of questions about this and these are for new students who are um, uh, uh, either uh, still deciding whether they want to enter or they've already decided that they um, are going to defer their enrollment maybe until winter. Um, there are some students who are, are deciding that they want to start taking class, classes in the fall, but they're going to stay in their home country and, and do that from abroad. And the questions are, what happens with my I-20 in that case? Do I need to get a new I-20 in that case? And in that case, the answer is yes. You, you will need to get a new I-20. What we will do for everybody who decides to either start in winter or start remotely outside of the United States in the fall is we're going to defer your I-20 start date uh, to winter. You do not have to request an I-20 again. You don't have to go through the uh, iGlobal process of requesting. The only thing that you'll have to submit are updated financials and then we'll electronically send you an updated I-20, it'll have an updated start date. 
and they won't have to pay the fee again, right? You won't have to pay the fee again. We're going to be out reaching out to those students. We're already keeping track. Um, we've sent out a survey to 6,000 students. Right now we have an 83% response rate. Um, we would like for you to continue answering those questions, whether you're going to study uh, at UC Davis in the United States or outside, because UC Davis is committed to providing you the educational experience that you need, whether you're here in person or whether you're abroad. So it's very helpful for us to know what your plans are so we can work with the people on campus who are planning courses. So we know what kind of courses we need to plan for you. So I would ask that you continue submitting it, although it does not have the same sense of urgency that it did uh, when we needed to put the comment on. So for now, we're gonna stop putting the comment on and we will, uh, we will figure out what to do with the students, I-20s who already have the comment. Yeah. And, 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 and just to sort of put a little plug on that, just so people understand this, that, I mean, you can't even tell right now whether people are in the country or outside the country. So you really do need people to complete the questionnaires for your own internal processing and, and coordination, right, uh, Tammy? Um, that, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and planning, I mean, you've got this huge job of coordinating with the pref professors and the syllabus and, and, and getting that, you know, ready. So this is, this government action not only threw off international students, it also threw the universities off and the international offices and created some chaos. And it's good to see that you folks are, are on top of it and getting it sorted out. But presumably uh, you will also be publishing more guidance as it comes down on your website and, and through your counselors as well. So this is just to augment all the other efforts that you do. This webinar is not the solution to all your questions. Uh, it is just to give some clarity on what has been so confusing that, that even I need to have Jasune there to make sure I, I, I can get it right. Uh, sorry, Wes, I kind of yeah. interrupted you on that. No, no, that's, that's okay. I, I just wanted to clarify one thing for students who are listening. Um, deferring an I-20 is not the same as deferring your admission, right? We're talking about uh, being CBIS active and having an active I-20 document. Um, if you're abroad, you can still enroll in classes and not be CBIS active. So, you know, when you said defer an I-20, they're not contacting admissions and saying, I don't want to be a student until winter quarter. Just wanted to clarify that. Great. Well, I don't know where we've been going for yeah. two and a half hours, whether or not Already. we uh, want to keep going or... Yeah. Uh, there is one question I've seen um, pop up quite a few times. So I thought we can mm -hmm. mention it. Students are asking if they can apply for a visa outside of a country um, their own, so a third country, you know, national. I don't know if you want to touch on that or if you want me to expand on that, Bernie. Yeah, I'll go there. Um, TCNs. Yeah. Um, I've actually, you know, just because I'm an immigration lawyer, um, you know, it is a fact of life that getting a student visa in some countries is much more difficult than other countries. The general rule is that you need a logical explanation to be in that other country, what they call third country nationals. So um, do I like what we call uh, third country national processing? So if you come from a country where it is extremely well known that it's difficult to get a visa, but honestly, you know, UC Davis is a very prestigious university. My experience is that even in what I'm going to call the more difficult countries, um, visas are going to get issued. Okay. Visas are going to get issued because it's UC Davis. So um, the question, of course, then comes up to COVID. Uh, your consulate is closed and is not scheduling appointments. Does it make sense to go to another consulate which is open 
in another country where you can legitimately claim to be there. Obviously, you've got to be there legally. So the answer is that, for example, in many of the European posts, uh, if you apply for a visa, well, why are you here? Well, you know, my, we have an apartment in, in, in Paris or we have a, you know, I have an uncle in London and I spent, so as long as you have a reason to be there, they will usually go for it. And sometimes that is necessary. Now there's another element to third country processing, which is Canada and Mexico. Um, for Mexico, they don't really want first time F1 applicants. They might consider renewals. That's the general rule at the Mexican consulates. In the Canadian consulates, they might accept you. The problem with the Canadian consulates is that they have a separate system for third country nationals. And the waiting line uh, for a third country national, I mean, I don't think you're gonna get an appointment in the next few months. You know, and that actually brings me to another question that I've seen quite a few times where people have said to me, look, I have an F2, I'm a derivative, and I need to change to F1. Can I do a change of status in the US? And the answer is, well, yes, you can. The problem is they take three, four, five months, and it's not going to get approved by September. So then you say, well, then travel abroad. And they're like, well, but I can't. Consulate's not open. So there are these difficult situations where, um, where we don't have full answers. That's why at the beginning of this presentation, I made it clear that I'm not going to give 100% yes to everybody's situation. What I am saying is that probably there is clarity for 70% of your situation, 70, 75 probably in the next week or two, there'll be more clarity and we'll go up to maybe 80, 85. We will never get to 100. The world is not a perfect place. And um, yeah, I'm sorry that it's not, what we do is not black and white. Uh, I always tell everybody it's more art than science. Um, there's creative elements. And what I like about third country national questions is people are being creative there. Well, I can't get a visa in my home country because of ABC. What about going to this other country which has less COVID or has less restrictions? And the answer is good thinking, creative thinking. Make sure that you can go there, be legal. Make sure that, you know, it's safe. There's always issues where, you know, I love Mexico, by the way. I love traveling in Mexico. Apparently, there's not as much COVID down there in Mexico. But, you know, if you're going down to uh, Ciudad Juarez or um, one of the other border towns, you need to know your way around. You need to understand safety issues. You need to read the State Department travel alerts and understand that walking around wearing a Rolex on the streets of Juarez is not always smart. Uh, especially outside the consulate, because they know you're there for a visa. So just be a little bit careful when you're in certain countries, if you are doing third country national processing. Um, we love these cases. We help people with these cases, but it's not something uh, to go into blindly. Uh, Bernie, can you, there was a question in the chat that I think would help everyone. Um, for the um, national interest exemption, if someone already has a visa, can you put the, the CDP uh, email that they need to uh, email? Do you have that address, uh, Jasune? Yeah, so it just depends on which, um, you know, port of entry you're going to enter. So it would be all port of entries. Or... What is uh, what... So we have one for like LAX and JFK that we use a lot. So I could put those two. Um, but they all have the same format, don't they? What's the JFK one? Mm. You have it? 
Sorry, you have to pull it up, but or maybe maybe this is something that we could get, um, and we can put in our we can put in the FAQs that we're going to develop based on uh, the questions it, here, because it depends on what your port of entry is. Like some people will come in through Atlanta, some people, mm -hmm. you know, depending on where you're flying from. So there is no single address for CBP, um, but well, to my knowledge, no, you have to go local on this. You have to. They have to be aware at that specific CBP post. Uh, and and where would we where would we be able to find that information then? Well, it's going to be on the CBP website, right? Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Your name? Yes. CBP.gov mm -hmm. and a list of local CBP offices. Um, they all have local offices. Uh, if we had trouble, could we go to the Deferred Inspection Office? Just your name? Um, they always but, open. Yeah, I mean, that's what we've been advising clients, but you know, we're, things are so fluid, we're not quite sure what the proper channel CBP wants us to take right now, but we're trying all avenues we can. So just the word deferred, D-E-F-E-R-R-E-D, -E 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 deferred inspection. So if you Google deferred inspection uh, Atlanta, um, I speculate that the local office contacts might come up and you just, um, I've got a valid uh, visa um, that was issued. Um, I have a valid I-20. Uh, just wanna be cautious. I'm arriving on flight 352 from New Delhi. Um, and uh, I understand that uh, it would be helpful to um, be aware of my personal details. Uh, what sort of information are you giving? Passport, I-20, visa number, just general information because um, again, the new F1 visas, when issued under me, et cetera, they will automatically notify CBP. So you're in the database. The issue that we're dealing with here is people who already have valid F1 visas, um, it's not 100% clear that the officer, the CBP officer will be aware that you comply. See, from their point of view, this visa was issued five years ago. They don't know what's been going on. That's why we do like fresh visas, but we also know that fresh visas are not easy to obtain. This is all new for CBP. CBP will get better in the next few weeks. Just students who are literally arriving in the next week or two uh, may want to be more cautious. So that's uh, something. I mean, every every student who's entered on an F1 knows you go to you get your I twenty first. You get your documents. You get your visa. But when you arrive in the U.S you still have to deal with the customs officer at the airport and they have to be comfortable that you are uh, in compliance with the visa and you're coming for a legitimate purpose. And all of this stuff is kind of complicated, even for these officers trying to learn. And, you know, just please be patient. Uh, please be respectful. I know what it's like when you get off a 15 hour flight um, and then suddenly they start asking you all these questions, but uh, just just be alert. Uh, and, and um, you know, the one thing that I've always uh, told students, um, uh, which is the most important thing, is that you're really coming to America to study. So, so wh why are you here? Well, you know, I'm majoring at blah, 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 at UC Davis and to show the officer that you are a legitimate student. You're not coming to party. You're not coming to play. You're not coming to look for a career at Amazon or, or, or Apple or Google. You are coming to study and that you are committed to study. Just always remember that is what an F1 is. I'm coming here to study and you are enthusiastic about it and Yes, this has been difficult, but you know it's difficult for everybody. So please uh, understand that all of these government officials 
or trying to follow the rules. The rules are complicated, but sorry, a long answer to a simple question, but I think sometimes people mm -hmm. lose the big picture of what an F1 is. And, you know, you've just sort of take it for advantage take it for granted, you know, I'm a student, I've been studying and yeah, come on, stop bothering me. Don't take that approach. Remember the government officials have their job to do. They need to make sure you have a valid visa. They make sure you're following the rules. And, and then just repeating my punchline, serious student intent, serious student intent. That is my winning ticket. If they see that, they tend to be a little bit more flexible and probably if people don't have everything 100% in order, maybe they'll issue you an I-515A and give you a little bit of slack to fix it up, right? Are you still getting many 515A notices, yeah. Wiz? Yeah, we, yes? we do. We do. Yeah. But yeah. if... Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I think that's a, an important message and maybe a good message to conclude on. Uh, Unless okay. there's any other, you think, uh, major questions that would uh, we can respond to? Well, um, maybe one last one. I uh -huh. see questions regarding uh, if students decide to go home and take the courses remotely at, in their home country, if that would affect their valid visa. So, you know, render it revoked or something like that. Uh, no. At this no, time, no, no. It, it will not. As long as your visa is valid and you have a valid, you know, endorsed I-120 and there's no travel restrictions, you should be able to enter with that I-20 when, once you're able to. And, and with that, that visa. Important. Yeah. And with that visa, right, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just check your visa validity date. Check your passport validity date. Um, you know, all of those good things. Thanks for raising that, Jasune. Well, mm -hmm. I'll pitch it back to you then, Wes. Uh, it's uh, great having hundreds and hundreds of people on the line. And I hope that we've added some clarity and we've been able to calm a few nerves, including my own, by the way, yeah. uh, because I worry also, we always worrying about all our cases. And I just think this yeah. is getting a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, again, thank you again, Justin A, uh, Bernie, um, for your time and uh, expertise this morning, this afternoon. And uh, thanks again to Tammy and Adrienne for uh, making this all happen with the webinar technology. So, thank and then you. thanks for all the attendees uh, tuning in today. And uh, again, this will be recorded or this is, has been recorded and we will put the recording on the SISS website and that's at sisss.ucdavis.edu. Thanks for okay. having us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. So, Adrienne, um, I, I can't see the count. Oh, yes, I can.